So welcome again, as I said, this is a part of our winter webinar series. This webinar series is sponsored by MnDOT's Office of Aeronautics and is being administered by the Airport Technical Assistance Program, also known as AirTap. We are located at the Center for Transportation Studies at the University of Minnesota. So AirTap um, has been around since 2000. It is the first of its kind in the nation, offering practical yet specialized training and resources across the state for those who operate, maintain, and administer Minnesota's public use airports. Minnesota's general aviation personnel across the state have had access to targeted information and training to reduce costs and improve the safety, quality, and the overall efficiency of airport operations. AirTap also helps airport staff build a community network for exchanging best practices and learning from one another. So we have four major service areas. We provide training, we provide training and education, in addition to providing a series of webinars we also help coordinate the annual Minnesota Airports Conference. So we provide technical assistance and access to experts, and we also have a variety of resources, both web-based and printed resources. As I mentioned earlier, this is a part of a series. So this is number three of four. The first two sessions were held in January. Those two are recorded and available on our website. And next week, we have the last one of this series. And for those of you who may be new to Zoom, uh, this is the, me the meeting platform side. So along the bottom is a black ribbon. You have a mute button. Please unmute yourself if you'd like to speak with any of the, communicate with any of the speakers. Again, and the video option also, if you want to share your video, you can. You can see everyone who's participating today in the chat. This is a great feature just to enter any questions you may have as it's being presented. Um, screen sharing, this is active for everyone, so but you won't have to worry about it. And as I said, it is being recorded and feel free to use any of the emojis that are available to, for you today. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Dominica with the FAA. Good morning. Thank you so much for uh, having us here, Catherine. We're very excited to, um, to be here with all of you. Um, so my name is Dominica Drosdell. I am the Senior Advisor um, for the Great Lakes Regional Administrator. And with me, I have four wonderful subject matter experts in different areas from the FAA. So we are hoping that um, you really do find this information helpful and um, you'll be able to better collaborate, as our title uh, stated, with the FAA. Um, so with me today, I have Lindsay Butler. Terry. Um, so she is from the Minnesota, uh, the Dakota, Minnesota District Airports District Office. Uh, we also have Andy Peak, who is the technical operations um, manager in the Minnesota District. Uh, John Lurch, who's our planning and requirements manager um, for the whole central service area. So that's it's pretty much the um, central part of the country. And then Matt Seibert, who is um, an engineering service manager. So he's the one who would be reviewing drawing specs that maybe an airport consultant would be um, proposing for a project, or he would be the one uh, engineering and implementing the project if it was done with FAA resources. Um, so we're very, very excited to speak to you today. Like I said, um, or like Catherine said, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to use the chat. Um, or, you know, just go off on mute and, and, and ask your question. So uh, with that, I will share my screen because we do have a presentation for you. Um, oh, and Catherine, I think you shared our file. Um, yep, I just uploaded it into chat. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so this is our presentation. Um, one second. Okay. Um, so why are we here all talking to you? Um, so uh, the regional administrator for the Great Lakes region um, was approached and she noticed that maybe projects that were um, being handled on airports, um, maybe there was not enough communication along with those projects. And so we decided to kind of do a test case for the Dakota, Minnesota Airports District Office to kind of provide a little bit more communication and tell you all, um, you know, what the FAA is looking for, uh, you know, when you should talk to the FAA, 
um, who you should talk to. So this is um, kind of like a series of outreach that we're doing to give you this information. And so each one of these technical uh, uh, experts who we have here from the FAA um, will talk to you about their piece. So you'll be able to see how the FAA kind of um, moves a project from maybe one group to another and, and what each group is um, involved with. So we, we wanted to start off with, you know, just a picture, right? You're planning to, you're planning a, a project on the airport and, you know, you're looking at a grass field and you're like, well, yeah, look at this. This is a perfect, perfect area, perfect site for a new hangar and apron. And, um, you know, maybe out there somewhere, there's something that looks semi-important, but it's really far away. So this should be no problem. It should, it should work perfectly. Um, and oh, then maybe you contact the FA or you know you're, you're having discussions and you're saying, oh, and, and by the way, we wanna start on construction on this project within two to three months. Um, so this, mean, this might seem like it never happens, but it actually does happen. So uh, you know, just wanting to kind of put together some considerations for you on, on uh, what to look out for. So this is a little bit of an eye chart, but basically we just wanna show you that, you know, even if you are out in the field, maybe there are some protection zones, um, you know, that that we would consider and, and we could help you um, look at and review. This one specifically, um, you know, it looks like it's, it's closer to the runway, but, um, you know, again, if, there, if you're out in the middle of an airfield, that doesn't mean that there's no impacts to FAA facilities or equipment. Um, so today we're going to go talk to you about uh, why and why to engage with the FAA. We're going to show you some examples, some you know pictures, some lessons learned um, that we've had over the years. Um, you know, Lindsay and and Andy are going to speak to you about the role of the district office and you know the technical operations group. And then John is going to talk to you about uh, reimbursable agreements and how far in advance we want to do those, um, why they're important, who the planners are, and then we'll go into questions and and the contact information. But again, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or just come off mute. Uh, so basically, you know, before you're making any kind of commitments, whether it's land use, business, financial, schedule commitments, um, or you're planning to start your environmental review, before you basically start spending money on detailed engineering, like talk to us. If that's one message that you kind of take away from, from this presentation is um, talk to the FA early. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, hand it over to Matt, who, as I said, is our engineering services manager, to kind of take you through the next set of slides. All right. So uh, good morning to everyone. Um, like Dominica said, my name is Matt Cyber, and I'm actually an engineering services manager out of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, my primary focus is navigational aids on airports. I, I have both an engineering and uh, construction and installation center. Um, I've been with the FAA a long time, almost 35 years. Uh, I do have previous e experience doing control towers and terminal radar systems, communication systems. I even spent a short uh, stint at the center, which we're not gonna talk about on here. But again, my primary focus is, is navigational aids. That's where most of my experience is at. All right, so uh, the next slide on here, th this is a typical slide that uh, we've been using for years around here. It shows uh, graphically all the different systems that are that can be located on an airport. Now, uh, most of the folks on here are probably very aware of these systems, but for those of you that are, are not, um, typically on an airport, uh, we basically have what we call an ILS, which are instrument landing systems, or we have visual aid systems. The visual aid systems are typically uh, a PAPI or VASI on the older systems in, in real systems. And essentially, a VASI is a visual aid that gives uh, vertical guidance to the runway. In, in a real system, in layman's terms, it's just two blinking lights that indicates the end of a runway. Now, we also do have approach lighting systems, which again, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, uh, we have a Malzer system, which is basically um, a set of lights that goes out 2,400 feet. Uh, it starts at the threshold of the runway, and then we have light stations every 200 feet to a point where then 
there's some flashers installed. Uh, the ALSAF system, which is our much more advanced system, has many more lights and has light stations at every 100 feet. The ALSAF system is used for the Category 2 and Category uh, 3 systems. Some of the other systems you're going to see on an airport, you'll see the runway visual range, which is um, weather information. It does tie into the AWOS or the ASOS systems. Uh, VORs, which I, I know with uh, the next gen, some of those VORs at some point may be going away, but we still do have a, a high number of VORs uh, in the NAS. Some are located on airfields. Um, a high number number of them are located out, out and about across the country. The NDB that's shown on here is what's called a non-directional beacon. That's an older system. That was a non-precision uh, guidance system that was used. There are probably a still, still a few NDBs left in the NAS, but over the years we've been working on um, decommissioning those systems. All right, next slide. Oh, yeah, and then also... Um, which I can talk about here. Also, uh, what I outlined there was the navigational systems, but of course, airports have air traffic control towers. Uh, we have communications facilities, which we call um, RTRs. Uh, there's ground radar, which is the ASD, the ASDX systems. Depending on the airport, uh, there'll be a, a terminal radar system, which is the ASR. So as Dominica had mentioned earlier, there's lots of FA facilities, uh, lots of criteria for these facilities being on the airport. So uh, again, part of this presentation is if someone's wanting to expand their airfield, even if a field or something looks wide open, it, it, it could affect a high number of other FAA facilities. Next slide. Um, one of the things, and I, we just have a few slides here on some of the NAV things, the localizer and the glide slope, these are the two primary pieces. I'm an, instrument light lighting system, instrument landing system. The localizer essentially lines an aircraft up on the center line of the runway and the glide slope again gives vertical guidance to the runway. As all of you probably know, the the typical glide slope angle would be a three degree approach. It does have a plus or minus tolerances. Um, some of the things when we're contacted by an airport that we get concerned about when it's concerning localizers and glide slopes, is uh, we have a critical area, which is identified in, uh, we have an ILS sighting criteria order, for those of you that care, 6750.16E. Uh, that identifies the critical areas for these systems. Um, essentially, the localizers, we typically install those outside the runway safety area, which is 1,000 feet. And we like to have the area, in general, flat out in front of those. Uh, localizer antennas, which is the top picture up here. Uh, generally, the 50 feet behind that needs to be clear. Uh, on some older ILS antennas, that localizer antennas, antennas we have, there is what we call a, a back course. Um, again, those are older systems, which are slowly being phased out of the NAS. But where that becomes critical is we have a lot of projects where the airport will want to clean up their runway safety area, or they're going to do some trenching out there. And where we like to get involved and get concerned is, is, is if that terrain out in front of the localizer or, again, the terrain out in front of the glide slope changes or is altered, um, we really would like to look at that because nine out of ten times those ILS systems are going to have to be flight checked, reflight checked. And, again, with a lot of government services, there's a process involved for getting that funded and for getting on their schedules. And um, flight inspection has a limited number of aircraft across the country. They also fly some international systems. So it's important that we're aware of any work that may be happening around these systems so we can get on flight check schedule. Okay, uh, these next couple slides, uh, again, like Dominica has had mentioned, these are just kind of some graphical representations. I'm not going to go through these um, number, number by number. The important thing about this slide, and Dominica, you can go to the next one or even the next one after that. The, the important thing is when an airport sponsor is out there and they're getting ready to do some more, it's really important if you could contact the FAA ahead of time because it, there are a lot of different 
things that we have to look at. There's if approach procedures are affected for a facility, um, those have to be looked into. And for those of you that don't know, to get a procedure updated, if it changes, that's a two to three year process all by itself. So if you're wanting to do something and you want to have it done in six months, if you're moving a glide slope antenna, uh, there's going to be an issue with schedule. That glide slope will be out of service for a long time. So we do look at a lot of things. Um, other things that we've had a real emphasis on here in the last few years is making sure the runway safety areas are kept clear. Um, like I said earlier, we install localizer antennas outside the thousand foot bar. Glide slopes we like to keep outside uh, 400 feet off the runway threshold or the runway center line. So there's just a large number of things that we have to look at. And I can tell you from my own experience, being here for a number of years, the, the sooner that the sponsor can engage the FAA, the better that things go. Um, typically on a reimbursable, which I know John Lurch is going to talk about uh, later on, uh, we get involved in the process of what the airport's doing and always provide an engineering review, possibly do the construction or provide construction oversight. There could be equipment that has to be provided or that might be an opportunity to replace equipment but all of those things take time and some of those things can take quite a long time and it, it's our uh, intent to work with the airport so the airport can maintain their schedules but we have a number of things just like I mentioned uh, procedures that take a set amount of time and those things um, can't be changed as as a a, a simpler example the engineering review time alone, uh, typically takes four to six months. And that's after we've re reviewed drawings. We have multiple levels of review we have to go to. So all of those things will affect the sponsor and their schedule and the service that they can provide to their customers. Uh, I'll I, I just mention briefly here, there's a slide in here for Pappies and also a slide for Vassies. Uh, again, most of you know this, this is a visual lighting system. Uh, if there's a glide slope on the airport, the PAPI will typically, or VASI will be loca located coincident with the glide slope system. The important thing on the PAPIs that's been coming up recently uh, with the new LED PAPIs are obstructions. Uh, the visual guidance order, which is, uh, for those of you who want to write it down, it's FAA order 6850.2C. It has a requirement in there to do an obstruction survey. One of the things, and, and as you can see on there, there's an obstacle clearance service, which is an OCS. Uh, what's coming up is trees. Um, a lot of these airports that have had VASI systems for years and years, we come in and put in a PAPI, and now we have a new set of uh, criteria to use. And what happens is when we do this survey is there's trees that end up showing up on the approach for the PAPI. And that can raise a lot of, concerns, even political issues, because, you know, airports don't like trees, but people who own property around airports like trees, and a lot of them don't like the government coming in saying you need to cut your trees down. So the sooner that can be identified, the better off we have. I mean, you can skip past this slide too. So, uh, like I said earlier, other facilities, uh, this right here is an AWOS or an ASOS system. Those are weather systems. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, the, uh, in, NDBs, we're not installing new NDBs anymore. That's an older system. Uh, those typically are in two configurations. There's either what we call a wagon wheel, which is essentially a bunch of circular antennas, and then a long wire system, which is an older system from years ago and essentially that's a telephone pole with, with a wire connected between the two of it uh, two of the poles that goes to an equipment rack uh, the VOR like I mentioned uh, that provides navigation uh, information to pilots to uh, also uh, approaches to airports and also for navigation across the country uh, GPS has changed the way the VOR is used, are used. However, the FAA is still going to maintain a backbone of VOR systems. And then the VOT, that's just a tuning system. Um, next slide. So with, with all of that being said, um, there are risks that happen when the airport's doing work out there. And then also even when the FAA's out there doing our, our own work. 
Oh, next slide. Uh, we hear a lot from a lot of the sponsors and maybe some even the internal FAA offices about why does engineering services need to have one of their people out there? Why do you guys need to be out there watching us what we're doing? You know, your work is a small, small part of the work that we're doing. Well, th this next series of pictures is going to show some real world examples of some of the things that we've run into when we were not out there or we were out there, but we were on a different spot on the airport. Most of you probably know with all the work on the airports, there's a lot of grading that goes on and there's a lot of cabling out on the airport. This picture here is a prime example of cabling that was not quite as deep as everyone had thought and it turns into spaghetti. Um, if these systems that were attached to this were in service, obviously they're now out of service, which affects the FAA's ability to provide service to the NAS, but more importantly, it really can affect the service that the airport is providing to the flying public. Next slide. This was a real system, and this was the light, one of the light units. I believe this maybe happened at International Falls. No? It was Crystal. Yeah, I believe this was Crystal, Minnesota. The um, airport up there was doing some work. They were doing some grading work. They had marked the real location. They went ahead and started their work before engineering services was able to get someone out there. Uh, they're out there. They've got a lot of grading equipment driving around, moving around. Next thing they know, one of our real light units uh, became flat. It, it What these kinds of things really uh, create is Equipment gets damaged. We don't have replacement equipment. We need to get more equipment. It may or may not be available in FAA inventory. So then we have to scramble to find another system. There's a cost involved, depending on how the reimbursables are written. The cost to replace the equipment could be borne by the sponsor, which could lead into tens of thousands of dollars. So again, this is in next picture too, Dominica. But again, that's just why. Engineering services likes to be on the airport. I mean, we're like everyone else. We make mistakes too. We miss things. But these are the, the things that we try to head off before they happen. And as everybody knows, having an extra set of eyes out there on the airport always helps. Yeah, I, I, again, a, a digging backhoe. Uh, backhoes and trenchers are the best cable finders I, I've ever seen. Uh, if there's a cable there, the, it'll find it. Um, again, I'm not sure where this location is, and if you can tell, but in this case, there was a concrete duct bank out there, which is there to protect the cables. But as everyone knows, a, a good sturdy uh, backhoe can dig up about anything. This used to be a Pappy power and control rack. Um, this has all the electronics, the disconnects for the Pappy system. Uh, for whatever reason, it got hit. Uh, when this gets hit, the pappy goes down. Uh, those pappy boxes are pretty delicate when they fall over. Uh, those circuit cards in there tend to break. And then again, uh, a system is now out of service, and it uh, takes time to put it back in service. That, yeah, I think that's it for me. Um, I guess before I go, does anyone have any questions for me? Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Matt. I mean, such great examples, right? So many lessons learned and, and I'm, I'm glad you were here to share them with everybody. So like I said, I think a lot of you guys know Lindsay from the airport district office. She's probably your go-to person for anything in the area. So um, Lindsay, take it away. Sure, thank you, Dominica. Um, I do recognize a lot of names on the screen, so it's great to see um, participation from a lot of our airports and consultants and um, even some other representatives from the ADO. So thanks for joining us today. Um, next slide, please, Dominica. So how do we help with your airport? Obviously, um, you know, we're probably the one you're talking to the most. Um, we are your front door to the FAA, so let us help you. Um, if you have a project that's not 
AIP funded or bipartisan infrastructure law funded, and you have a proposal that comes onto your airport and says, hey, I want to build a hangar in that lovely green space that Dominica showed in the beginning, talk to us. Let us help you. Let us um, work through some of the um, information that you need. Um, obviously, it's important to keep to do your planning, keeping your airport projects and your master plan up to date. Master planning isn't just what you want to fund with um, our money or your money. It's, you know, it's all encompassing. It's kind of your um, roadmap to your airport. So it starts with having clear and complete understanding of all the facilities and equipment you have on your airfield, including um, you know, some federal facilities like what Matt was showing. Um, then we can help you through the environmental reviews for the projects on your airport, help you through the design standards. We just had an advisory circular um, released uh, late last summer that was a wholesale redo of our um, advisory circular for design. Um, 13B is now the new um, design standard um, for the FAA for all of our um, airport design standards. Um, it was a large scale uh, update. It has a whole bunch of new information in it. I strongly encourage if you haven't already downloaded it, please go to the FAA website and find it. Um, and you will don't hit print because you'll burn out a bunch of trees, but definitely um, download it and save it and um, read through it. There's some really good graphics in the um, appendices as well that will help you through some new runway um, alignment changes and some taxiway design changes. Then compliance. When you um, get a grant, you have grant assurances where we help you through all of those things. Um, obviously, most of you know that um, we carry a big bag of money around. I usually carry it to all the conferences and hand out money to people that show up. So make sure you come to the state conferences because you get money. Just kidding. I wish it was that easy, but you know, really the financial piece of where we are um, is the culmination of all of your planning, environmental, and lots of years of talking to the FAA to make your project come to fruition. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So if you don't know, if you have federal equipment like Matt showed on your airfield, we can help you. We can look it up. Um, we can see what the equipment you have out there is, who owns it, whether you own it or not, whether it's federally response, whether the federal responsibility or whether it's a state responsibility. You know, in Minnesota, we have a lot of um, on airport things that are owned and operated and maintained by the state of Minnesota. So if you have equipment, which most of you have some sort of equipment out on your airfield, maybe not a fancy instrument landing system, but almost every airport has pappies and reels um, and other types of facilities out there. If you have those facilities, and you're like, I don't even know, is that mine? Is that the state's? Is that federal? Um, let us look it up for you. Let us find out for you so that we can um, then plan to make sure that if we're going to be impacting that through a project, we know who's responsible for it. Next slide, please, Dominica. <clears throat> Next slide, Dominica, please. For some reason I'm stuck. Hold on a second. That's okay. <laughs> the next slide I'll just talk through um, talks about timing and communication. Um, I think that was kind of the overarching message of um, really this presentation is don't we really don't have the luxury of time. Um, if you want to do something within, you know, the next few months, um, then you're going to have to be looking at uh, really um, trying to accelerate that. We. Um, the airport district office can help you, but most of the other lines of business, if you're going to be impacting something, um, <clears throat> you we need to have a conversation well in advance. Um, I think Matt said, if you're changing a procedure, it's probably two to three years in advance. Um, John will get into some timing of some reimbursable agreements. Um, you know, the wheels of sometimes government do, do move slow. And so um, if you're going to be impacting um, a federally owned and operated uh, nav aid or piece of equipment, um, make sure that you definitely call us first and we'll circle the circle the group together and say hey we really worry about the timing um, of that 
So think about what you're going to be doing, whether you're going to be um, building it below ground or um, ground digging, like what Matt showed, where um, uh, excavator uh, is a really great way to find cables. Um, probably not the most ideal, because you'll definitely find them and dig them up. Or if you're building an above ground facility, um, what type of hangar that could, you could have reflectivity, um, obstructions, or signal blockages. A lot of people are kind of caught off guard. They're like, well, I just want to put it over there. And then they don't realize that there's signals that get in the way of that. Dominica, next slide, please. So um, really, as I said before, um, partnership with us um, definitely is helpful. Um, we are your front door. We can definitely help you navigate um, if you have federal equipment. So scheduling CIP meetings, scheduling monthly meetings. Um, you know, if you have a, t a tenant or a developer that wants to build, make sure that they give us a call or give, you know, and then we can direct you to the appropriate um, branch within the FAA that they need to talk to. But always reach out with questions. Um, there's never a bad question when you have a proposal of something that may occur on your airport. Thank you, Dominica. Thank you, Lindsay. And, and definitely, let's just reiterate that there's never a bad question. Ask away. It's better to ask than to, to have to figure out a solution when you're, you know, at crunch time. Um, so now we're going to go to uh, Andy Peak. He's going to talk about um, a little bit more about the ATO. Hey, thanks, Dominica. Yeah, yeah, it's good to see a lot of familiar uh, names out there on the screen across the uh, Minnesota area. So while the airport's district office, they may be the eyes and the ears through the Dakotas in Minnesota, there's, I think, about 25 folks with the ADO right now. Uh, our staff through technical operations, we're the boots on the ground. So we have over 300 people. Uh, we span from this current district uh, lines up with the uh, air traffic district and overlay. We go from Michigan to Montana and from Canada all the way down to Omaha. So when you're out working on the airfields, and as Lindsay mentioned, you have equipment out there. Um, our folks are out there, the ones that uh, do the preventive maintenance on that equipment and do the marking for that uh, cable locates. And we do the corrective maintenance when something bad happens out there. Um, and so um, uh, feel free to reach out to, to our folks as well. Um, if you see them out there, um, we can also be a channel or a conduit to get a conversation going as to what we can find out there so we don't run into the, any of these uh, catastrophic events that are out there. Um, just to echo on some of what uh, Matt had started with, um, not only are there long lead, um, long lead times for getting into the pipeline and working through things, uh, our agency, just much like you, you folks out there, we're running into supply challenges out there as well. So even when we do come across something that either we impacted or we plan on impacting, um, you know, that's starting to come into the conversation of timelines as well, as well, what we need to coordinate out there. Um, and then the other thing I would add in before I, I get into uh, a little bit of our example of kind of how we view things is that um, uh, Bill is a great program, right? We just heard it all through the State of the Union. You guys are hearing uh, work through the Office of Airports, uh, $20 million coming through AIP, congratulations. Um, uh, the reality is though, FAA, uh, Technical Operations, we also have $5 billion of project work that's coming through the pipeline. Half of that's dedicated right now towards our air traffic control tower modernizations. And the other half is coming through projects out there as well. And so um, all of the resources are constrained as we move through things. We have our own projects on the airfields, enhancements and upgrades that we're doing. Uh, and so that all comes into play into the conversations of, of coordination and collaboration as we go forward. But today specifically, uh, next slide, Dominica, um, what we want to share is that we all see things through different lenses. Um, you know, even on this meeting right here, we have airport engineers, planners, um, airport personnel, FAA as well. Um, the reality is we all see things differently. Um, and so um, part of this is just to highlight that, that we see things through different lenses. I see, uh, I believe this is Evoleth, Evoleth Airport. And uh, we're looking at possibly a runway shift, uh, pretty benign, maybe it's a visual approach no impacts, but the reality is what the agency sees with this, next slide, is we see a runway narrowing. We know procedures can be impacted. Let's talk about procedures and aircraft right now. Um, there's a shortage of a flight time for our flight check aircraft. Um, when something happens at O'Hare, the resources get dedicated towards O'Hare. That means everything out in the system is constrained. All right, so when you talk about impacting procedures, 
you may be looking at four, six, or even later months down the road to even get those aircraft queued up to change a procedure. Uh, we, we see infrastructure happening with this. Likely a reimbursable agreement is needed for the design and construction. And um, if things are going well, maybe there's a target of opportunity where the agency, as I mentioned with our bill money, we're stepping in and updating some of our equipment, be it pappies, reels, or other things along the way. And so um, lots of things happen and something that is uh, looks fairly easy, looks fairly simple, but lots of moving parts. And that's where that reimbursable agreement comes into play where we'd love to have that conversation uh, to how we can work together. Next slide, please. Um, a proposed hangar construction area. Great. Might have been planned out uh, years, gone through environmental assessments, hit a planning process, uh, completed airspace and planning. Um, uh, so, so we see a building area that's ready to go um, from an airport development standpoint. But hold on, what does the agency see? Next slide. We see challenges. Uh, currently, there could be line of sight challenges. There could be our uh, uh, radio signal, uh, potential line of sight issues. And uh, there certainly could be things that change a missed approach or a procedure development with a new structure that's put into place. So something that has been planned out and is in, in the process of being developed might still have challenges along the way. And so again, uh, uh, communication and coordination going forward are some things that, that come into play with that. Next slide, please, Dominica. Here's another one out there from the Dakotas. Um, we uh, The blue hatch in this case indicates some grading that might help with airfield developments, might be uh, something to get some wildlife out of an area. Um, um, and, and certainly maybe even help with um, supporting clearing operations for snow when we get snow depths in a glide slope critical area. Um, so great benefit to an airport um, and good to see uh, enhancements and changes made along the way, but the agency might see a couple other things. Dominica, next slide. We could see it impacting FAA cables. Um, um, any impact to a glide slope critical area may change or, or require changing the alignment of those antennas on a glide slope. If we change antennas on a glide slope, we may need to flight check it again. If we are getting to that point and we flight check it again and it's out of tolerance, the glide slope may in fact even go out of service or be inoperable. And so minor changes or enhancements out on the airfield where, where we think it's benign um, may come into a, a major impact uh, to the agency. Next slide. Ah, this one looks like Duluth. Uh, Duluth is in the process of, in this case, looking like uh, control tower relocation. That's phenomenal. Duluth is a very established airport, uh, been there for years, uh, phenomenal planning, very proactive uh, airport in collaboration, looking at new things should be great for potential sites maybe. Um, great conversation. And um, while we're looking at sites for a, a new air traffic control tower and making sure the controllers can see what they need to, um, the reality is that airfield is a very complex airfield when it comes to technical operations and the equipment we have up there. You'll see this in the next slide, the challenges we have. One of the challenges is we've got a, a search radar up there. Um, and so anything you put on that, on that airfield close to that search radar could create shadows along the way and have impacts to that. Duluth is also one of our locations where we have uh, enhanced approaches, uh, CAT2 approaches. And the second depiction there, that white, looked like somebody dumped over a can of white out over the airport, is all of the shadows that are currently put into place from a CAT2 approach and or RVR impacts. So while, while planning is putting in place and we talk about airspace and we think about airspace and X, Y, and Z components, the reality is that none of that's probably captured in that airspace study through there. There's a lot more that comes into play with it. And that's where our agency or our component of the agency comes into place to talk through those things. Next slide. Uh, this one looks fairly benign. Um, we're talking about uh, maybe a construction haul route uh, for a potential project. Looks like that's going by another uh, search radar or potentially there's an RVR there. Looks like there might be a, a, a critical area in that circle that we're going through. Great, traveling through there on a, on a bluebird day, no problem at all. How about going through that, that area on a day where um, that nav aid or that piece of equipment is in play for IMC conditions? Can we do that? Does that come into factor? Do we need conversations of that as either the construction phasing or planning is going through and or during operations that are out there? 
Um, and so, uh, again, uh, somebody might see that, uh, hey, it's, it's simple. We're using an airport perimeter road, no problems. Well, what are you, what are you driving on that road? And then uh, finally, um, another example of looking at doing some runway work. Uh, maybe this is a, a shave and pave project where we're working across there, or maybe we're actually uh, digging, um, doing some full depth restoration on a, on a piece of pavement that's out there. Um, we're going to come into FA facilities. We just we need to know where that's at. If you're digging across our stuff, uh, certainly we, we need to be there because um, um, the reality is any any impact to some of our services um, and some if some of them are taken out, they require a flight check. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, once you tip the flight check bucket over, it's hard to put all of that back in there and get everything lined up. It's not something you do instantly in a switch and turn it back on. So that's what we have from technical operations. Um, we're here to help you guys along the way and uh, can certainly reach out to us if we can do that. And from here on out, we'll turn it over to John. He can talk through our reimbursable agreement slides. Thanks, Andy. Um, so as Dominica mentioned earlier, I'm John Lurch. I work for the Central Service Center out of Fort Worth, Texas. And we, from Canada, pretty much down to Mexico, um, we have facilities. And uh, my team specifically is a NAS planning team, and we have a lead planners assigned on our team to each state geographically. And we'll talk about that here in a few minutes. Um, but we are the, the reimbursable people. And uh, also, we're the entry point to the ATO in a lot of cases for project work. So you can go to the next couple slides, two slides. Um, so talked a bit about reimbursable agreements so far. What is it? Um, it's really the mechanism that enables the FAA to get engaged with your project. Um, it's a it's a memorandum of agreement. Um, it outlines specifically what the airport's going to do, what the FAA is going to do, uh, the associated estimated cost, and uh, and it's a just a formal contract that allows several different things. Um, it, the FAA cannot engage in in supporting your project until one of these are in place. Uh, some of the things that we can do with that are technical analysis, where you're doing your site selection. We can do engineering, um, engineering design and oversight. That's what Matt's team does. Um, we can provide equipment specifications, uh, provide equipment as a target of opportunity. There may be maybe several instances out there, as Andy mentioned, um, where we could replace a VASI with a PAPI during your, your project. Um, we can provide construction oversight and installation and testing and flight inspection was also mentioned several times. So those are some of the, the things that the reimbursable affords us to do. Um, you can go to the next slide. But when is it required? Um, as early as possible, um, simply simply put, like Lindsay said. Uh, so during the initial discovery phase of your project, um, if you th even think there may be an impact to an FAA facility, call us up. And uh, if you're looking to relocate, replace, or modify um, something that's going to impact the, the FAA's equipment, call us up. Um, whenever, uh, yeah, let's see. Any of the tech ops characteristics would be impacted. Matt mentioned the, the glide slope and, and the grading around that. Um, any grading around a glide slope critical area could impact that. And we need to, we need to know about that. That would prompt a, a flight inspection. Um, any development of, of something, something that's going to uh, create a flight procedure to be modified or, um, or new one even, uh, we need to know years in advance for that, as has been mentioned. The next slide, again, when should you contact us? Ideally, three years before construction. Um, Andy just mentioned uh, the $5 billion that ATO has received for, from the, the bill law. Um, we have a, a five-year plan, work plan, that we're um, creating across all our different engineering platforms, and it's to sustain and modernize the NAS. Um, and this, this bill money just really enhanced the, the need for resources to do that. Any project that comes into this work plan where engineering services or, or FA needs to support your project um, through a reimbursable agreement impacts that five-year plan. The closer we get to um, next fiscal year, the harder it is for us to react to that. Uh, we call them pop-up projects and, and uh, we try to avoid those at, at all costs um, at this point, which is the main reason we're reaching out here. I'm um, talking about the need to communicate early. Um, it also allows us to research uh, for FAA equipment replacements and, and integrate into the airport's projects, reduces outages, reduces impacts to your, your airport users. Uh, it does that through preventing multiple runway shutdowns as well. Um, and also it helps us, give, gives us the opportunity to look at the overall work plan at your airport and where your project may be located. And maybe we wanna 
do another project, do our project at another time. Uh, that way we can we can deconflict those projects. Whenever your project looks like it's going to impact FAA cables, that's been a big topic here today uh, for utilities where we need to relocate um, cabling, things like that, uh, contact us. Uh, whenever you're requesting new services, such as a uh, new FCT, uh, federal contract tower, um, we need to know years in advance if you're even thinking about building that on your airport or, or applying for that program. And anytime you're doing a master, uh, airport master plan update, um, as Lindsay mentioned, it's a good time to just engage in, dis in, in the discussion. So there are a few different types of reimbursable agreements we can enter into. Um, a small scale reimbursable would be the, the quickest. It's very restrictive. All that does is allow um, the FAA to engage in your project and start discussion, discussions. Um, engineering services can't enter into um, those discussions or, or spend time reviewing drawings until there is an agreement in place. So this is one if, if something pops up, we do have a pop up. This is one that we will consider entering into just so we can get quick engagement. Preferably, if we're, we're talking years in advance. Um, standard design reimbursable agreements and uh, engineering and re, uh, resident engineer oversight, they take two to four weeks, three to six weeks, respectively. Um, they, they just allow us to get more in depth to review your drawings, to provide input to your, your design. And lastly, the biggest and the one that takes most, the longest to, uh, to execute is the construction installation reimbursable. Um, it, when we get down to these agreements, we're talking detailed scope of your project and uh, exact schedules, cost, everything. One thing worth noting is we've talked about engineering services resources being used to work on all these reimbursable agreements. We do have contract vehicles in place that would allow an outside entity uh, through an FAA contract to provide oversight or, or assistance in reviewing some of these. When that happens, it ex extends that timeline to enter into these agreements even longer. Um, so, and again, these all these timelines are very tentative. Um, and they, they assume that when FAA sends the, the agreement to the sponsor for uh, review, for signature, for funding, that the turnaround is very quick. Um, we know there are instances where uh, elected officials may need to, to sign the agreement and, and approve it before it can be executed. So that could, could drag on the timelines. The next slide is um, risks of an untimely funded reimbursable agreement. Um, extensive delay um, to your project uh, could impact your users um, not having the service or the facilities available uh, when they come into your airport uh, could diminish again that the services for those users it frustrates the users we hear <laughs> we hear a lot of um, complaints regarding this and with related to reimbursable agreements so we want to avoid them as much as possible and get these agreements in place early um, as i mentioned engineering services resources uh, we have a five-year plan that is maxed out completely at this point, um, and we don't have, well, speaking candidly, we don't have enough resources to do all the work today. So any reimbursable agreement that is pop up is, it's very difficult to, to insert into the work plan. And the earlier the project construction start date is, uh, the harder it is. Um, and again, engineering services cannot use uh, labor hours to support until this reimbursable agreement is funded. And the next slide is the assignments for my team. Um, Eric Thacker is your lead planner for Minnesota, and here's his contact information. Um, this also just kind of shows the, the entire service area where we're, where we're located, and, and uh, feel free to share this information with, with anyone outside of Minnesota that you contact with. Um, so I guess with that, we'll open it up to any questions. Did we do death by PowerPoint? You know, I think it's a lot of information, John. So, you know, if anybody has any questions, even after after reviewing the slides again, or, you know, you, you come up with something, you know, feel free to reach out. Like, we're, we're here, we're available. You could contact Catherine. We have our contact information, um, I believe, in that PDF um, that Catherine uh, put in, in the chat. Um, so at any point, if you have a question, please feel free to reach out if 
if, if you don't have one at, right now. But with that, anything? I just, I just want to say thank you, John, Lindsay, D Dominica, Andy, and Matt for sharing this valuable information with everyone today. And I will be sending out a um, follow-up email with a eval link for an evaluation, and I'll also include the um, presentation for those who joined after I entered it into the chat. So, Yeah, thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye.